kicking off a brand new series today called Reconnect. Um, how many of you love Reconnection stories? Say amen. You say, well, I don't really know what you're talking about, Pastor Vince. And uh, well, you do if you've ever scrolled through your social media feed and you ran across the, uh, the military reunions. You know what I'm talking about? How many you know what I'm talking about? Like you'll be scrolling through and all of a sudden they're like soldiers coming home and then they show like a four minute video that you only see about 30 seconds of because you cry through the rest of it. Anybody with me on that? Like I'm a ball, I am, I am a ball baby. Like I, I cry all the time. It's just something that I do. It's my spiritual gift is crying. Um, it comes in handy. All right. Sometimes you just need a good cleanse and, and, and I'm thankful that God's given. I prayed one time in my life. I had a cousin that passed away from cancer at 17. And uh, when he died, I prayed. I said, God, I don't want to cry. I don't ever want to cry again. And for about six years, God granted my request. And I just felt empty. And then uh, I, I'm thankful for the grace of God because he, he allowed me to cry again. And when he opened him, I said, God, don't ever stop that. If I, if I cry, and now he's funny, that God we serve, because I cry at everything. Like... <laughs> Like, I, I mean, I, I, you remember Extreme Home Makeover with Ty Pennington? Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, it's not that funny, Patrick. Leave me alone. All right, just back off, dude. All right, so, but literally, I'm, I, I'll sit there, and, and they can be commercial, like Matthew McConaughey selling the Lincoln. I'm like, that dude. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I just, it gets all over me, and so uh, it's so funny because I, I didn't, I never, never wanted to be a crier, but I am, so I'm thankful that God gave it to me. Uh, I'm going to cry today when I read uh, this story in Scripture, this, this message in the Scripture. Uh, when I think about the goodness of God, when I think about the redemption, the re reconnecting, this idea, and here's what we, we, we live in a culture right now, it's been a little interesting over the last year, is that we're starting to see people in the last several months start to reconnect. They're going, well, let's, we didn't know these terms two years ago, new normal and, and, and those kind of things. We just didn't use them, and if we did, it didn't make any sense, and now everybody knows what you mean when you say it. And so this idea of what is the new normal, what is it going to look like, and we just started saying, God, I know that what, there's, a, there's a story in the Old Testament, we see this often, where Israel does really, really good, and then they do really, really bad, and they get taken into captivity. I mean, God sets them free, and they do really, really good, and then they do really, really bad, and then they go into captivity. That's kind of the system that Israel lives out through the Old Testament. But there's a place where God actually comes to one of the prophets, and he says, hey, those that have been spread out, those, those, those children of mine who have been dispersed and are living in other nations, go get them and bring them home. God's asking in those passages for a reconnect. Bring them home. Since the beginning of Scripture in the book of Genesis where God walks with Adam and Eve, we talked about this last week, His desire is to be with us, to be connected to us. And, and sin caused a division. And so maybe your reconnect isn't from the last year. Maybe you're here this morning and you just rolled in today and now you got this crying, snotty-faced preacher looking at you and you don't know what to do with it. You may not even realize that today was God's attempt to reconnect with you. For some people, you know you're looking to your right or your left, and there are people that are not here that because five years ago they got mad at the church, because 10 years ago they got hurt by something that happened, and it's amazing to me how we allow imperfect people to hurt us, and, and yet we do. We, we, we get hurt by, by people that are flawed just like we're flawed, but, but when we get hurt, we end up isolating or we step away and we go, I'm not ever going to put myself in that situation again. So there are people even now that, that were raised up in church that know the goodness of God, but because of a moment, have stayed away. And I'm praying that over the next several weeks in this series that you and I would be challenged to reconnect them, to go find them, to go to those children of God that are dispersed and displaced and say, come back home. Come back home. There's, if there's a seat at the table, you'll understand the reference here in just a moment. But in doing that, in, in this redemption story, we, we know that at real life, we, it's been a weird year for us. So as you came in today, if you, if you ended up walking down towards the end of the, the foyer out there, you've seen, we're, we're going to look at reconnecting to groups. We're going to look at reconnecting to growth and community and how we as a church continue to function as the church that God intended us to. 
to continually be changing this community, to continually be changing and reaching one soul and one community and one family. That's who we are, and, and we're going to do that regardless. That's just what God has called us to do, so it's what we're going to do. So there's going to be opportunity for you, and today I pray, I pray that you take it. There'll be more at the end of service about that, but I pray you take the opportunity to reconnect to not only the person of God, but the purpose of God in your life, because you have one. It wasn't by accident that you showed up here today. You didn't get out in the rain today and go and just trip into church. That didn't happen. All right? You're here for a reason. So today, we're going to be talking about this, this road to redemption. And, and, and so as we talk through, i got to give you some backstory. How many of you recognize the name David from the Old Testament? Hands up if you know. How many of you recognize the name Saul, King Saul from the Old Testament? Yeah, good. How many of you recognize the name Jonathan from the Old Testament? Less hands. All right. Jonathan was King Saul's son and would have been David's best friend. If I lost a lot of you on Jonathan, I'm about to lose a lot more of you. How many of you have ever heard the name Mephibosheth? Like five of you. All right. I know some of you with kids or you're about to have children. Maybe you're pregnant. Maybe you're part of that pandemic baby boom. Thank Jesus for that. Yeah. How many of you have been pregnant or are pregnant in the last six months? Give me a shout. Woo! See, I told you. They're here. <laughs> they're here. Got babies coming. Our, our toddler area is cram-packed, baby. It's going to be awesome. I, I love seeing people. I love seeing kids in church. But, and so, but if you're sitting here and you're trying to decide, I know, I know that uh, Mephibosheth needs to be on the table. As far as a baby name, I'm just throwing that out there. It's, it's uncommon. I don't know what you'd call him for short. Meth. <laughs> Let's not do that. <laughs> Meth. Mephi yeah, it was a PH, not a TH. That's different, all right? <laughs> Mephibosheth is somebody that not a lot of people know about. And he's not actually spoken about a lot in Scripture, but I think in regards to this series and this sermon and where where I hope you and I can go as believers. And you may be here this morning, if you're a believer here this morning, then I need you to hear this from a different perspective. I need you to hear this from David's perspective. If you're here this morning, maybe you don't know Jesus, then I need you to maybe, you, you might relate a little bit more with Mephibosheth. You may relate with him more. There have been seasons in my life where I've been on both sides of the table. And I'm thankful that the scripture is a living book that way, that where I'm at is where it reaches me. Where I'm at is where it reaches me. And so as we walk through this idea, let me give you some backstory. So King Saul was appointed the king, and he had been made the king by the people. They said, we want a king. And God said, I don't know that they were ready for a king. They said, we want a king. And so they picked him one. And they picked him one based on looks. The Bible said this dude stood head and shoulders above everybody else. Good looking, strapping young man. And they chose him based on how he looked. Never a good idea. Never a good idea, okay? How many of you know that to be true? Say amen. amen. Yep, so, so they picked Saul, and now Saul is the king, and he is ruling the people, and he is not doing a great job of it. But during his reign, the Bible says that God looked upon Saul, and his favor was no longer with him, and so he chose another. He found this shepherd boy named David. From the house of Jesse, from the land of Bethlehem, there was this shepherd boy named David, and this, the prophet went to Jesse's house, anointed David to be the king. Now, just because he was anointed as the king didn't mean that the time of his appointment was ready. So he gets anointed to be king and rolls right back out to the sheep field. Okay? He's not, he didn't get anointed and then, boom, he's on the throne. That's not how it worked. So he's anointed to be king. Well, word starts to travel a little bit. David starts to get some notoriety because he'd been gifted. Man, God had just poured it out on David. And so we see the Spirit of God moving mightily in David to the point where King Saul starts having these nightmares. He can't sleep. I need somebody to play music to get me to sleep. Here's the providence of God. How many people in Israel do you think played an instrument? Well, oddly enough, this guy in the king's court says, hey, I know this guy in Bethlehem who's got a son named David who plays harp pretty good. Maybe we should have him come and sing. Okay. So that worked out well. So David now starts to get audience with the king. God is preparing him for the appointment. He's not been anointed yet, but he's preparing him. He's putting him in the right rooms 
so that he's ready for when the time comes. So David is there, and in this time at the king's house, he begins to form this friendship with a guy named Jonathan, which is King Saul's son. And it's quite the friendship. The Bible says that their hearts were knit together, that there was just such a best friend type of mentality. And some of you have had that with people, and you understand what that is. There was a loyalty between these two guys, Jonathan and David. But then David has this moment with a giant. How many of you know what the story I'm talking about? Yeah, that's the big one, all right? That's the coloring book section of the Bible we all are familiar with. We know David had this moment with the giant where he stands up and says, you come against me with a sword and a shield, but I come against you in the name of the God of Israel. And here we go, and then, man, here Goliath is throwing down insults and all this stuff, and David just runs into the valley with a slingshot. Love David, okay? Let me back up. I love this moment of David because David has some moments, all right? We're not going to unpack all that today. But so David now is known in Israel. He is known. He's the giant slayer, man. This is the guy that took out Goliath. And so they start having parades and people, and there are people dancing in the street like Mardi Gras, straight up Mardi Gras. There's one part that David's wife is like those other naked women dancing in the street. And I mean, she comes full at him because it's that kind of party, all right, when David shows up. I don't recommend naked parades in the street, just so we're clear, so you all understand. I'm trying to give you backstory. That's probably going to go online. <laughs> so we have David here, and what they cheer at the parades is what starts getting under Saul's skin a little bit. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. What? He just killed a giant. But the chant got bigger. And how many of you know sometimes the voice of the crowd gets loud? Yeah, it's like we might live in that culture today, huh? Yeah. And the voice of the crowd got loud and Saul started listening to it and he start, his insecurity started swelling up in him and welling up in him and he had it out for David. From that point on, there was a shift that takes place where Saul's sole mission, his only mission, he wasn't concerned about ruling the people or ruling the nation. He was only concerned about killing David because David was appointed to be king. And Saul was the uh, appointed king at the time, and so there was a problem. And so Saul spent the last several years of his life chasing David, trying to kill him. Chased him through the mountains and the hills and the caves and the rivers and the creeks and everywhere else you could chase somebody. He chases David to kill him. And through that whole time, Jonathan stayed loyal as a friend to David. And so this story goes on, it tracks on, and we see finally Saul dies. Jonathan is dead. And David takes his role, his seat, as the king. Now, culturally, when a king changes or when a kingdom shifts power, there is a thing that you do that you must do or there's a threat. And the thing that you do that you must do is if, if you are the king or if I am the king and you want to take over, not only do you need to kill me, but you need to understand that I have three sons. And so in order to make sure there's no threat from my lineage, you got to go get my sons too. Saul is dead. Jonathan is dead. Mephibosheth. Because they didn't want Saul coming back in. And so we see down the road, and this, we're going to kind of do a time walk here as we walk through this. First Samuel, or 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, it says, and David says this. David is now on the throne. He is the king. This is years beyond Saul and Jonathan and, and their death. Is there still anyone left to the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Jonathan was a good dude, good friend of mine. I want to show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not still someone in the house of Saul that I might show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. Now, how did that happen? Well, let's back up. 2 Samuel chapter 4, we see Jonathan, Saul have died. And it's got back to the servants that the house of Saul has fallen. And so the servant scoops up the kid. 
Jonathan, the son of Saul, this is what it says in verse 4, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. Now, this is how he became that way. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. It's the first time we hear his name mentioned. First time we hear his name is attached to his handicap. It's not only attached to his handicap, but it's attached to his situation. His situation is, I'm on the run. I have to hide. I can't be here anymore because they're going to kill me. So I don't know about you in your life. I don't know if maybe you've ever thought through redemption this way, and I want to just kind of, I want to unpack redemption this way. If redemption is coming back to God, then there has to be something that is keeping us from God. Something that has separated us from God. And, and, and we, even though we as believers, I know Jesus Christ, but there are still things, there are still days in my life where I am not as close to him as I should be, and it has nothing to do with what God has done on his side of the reconnect. It has everything to do with what I've done on my side of the reconnect. And I want to just talk through this today about Mephibosheth so that you understand that here is the king saying, I want to do something kind, but that is nothing like what Mephibosheth is thinking because there are some things separating him from coming back. The first one is this, the situation. As I said, he was the son of the former king. He was a prince. He was, he was the prince, the son of a prince. He, he was in line for the throne, and yet now that throne is no more. And so he left. He was going to hide. He is in hiding. I can't even tell people my name. Because if I tell them my name, even though I'm not in Israel, I'm over here in Lodabar staying at some other person's house. It's not even my house. I'm sacking up at some dude's house, and, and it's, I have to stay away, and I have to stay on the down low because if they know I am alive... Then they're going to kill me. For some of you, maybe your story's not that extreme. Obviously, we don't live in that culture anymore. But I know for some of you, I want to just ask you this. Did, did Mephibosheth ask to be born into the family that he was born into? No, no one does. There, there wasn't a pre-moment where Mephibosheth said, hey, if we could make it to where my grandfather is a psychomaniac, that would be awesome. He didn't pray that, but that's what ended up happening. So here he is in a situation. The situation that he is in is not of his own making. It's just made. And there are people today that I know that sit in churches and outside of churches that the reason they do not reconnect with God is because it's based on a picture they have of the situation they've come out of. We've never had that before. I've never known God before. We never went to church before. This is just who we are. This is what we do. And we get into these things, and then church we call it this. We call them generational curses. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or because your grandpa did it and your dad did it, that means you must do it. I'm, I'm an angry person. Why? Because my grandpa had a short temper and my dad had a short temper, so I got a short temper. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> if you're offended that I just said it was dumb, think logically about it for a moment. My dad is five foot six. What if I said, well, I'm short because he's short? That doesn't make any sense. I'm not short. I mean, I'm short not compared to Aaron, but like real people that aren't giants. <laughs> Literally, I don't, this is a sidebar, okay? Literally, you come in on Sunday morning. If Taylor is here and Aaron are here, I feel like the smallest person on the planet. Taylor is six foot eight, and Aaron is six foot six, and I walk in feeling like Rick Moranis, like this big. <laughs> Some of you don't know who that is, and that's okay. But anyway, here we have this moment, this situation that, the Mephibosheth doesn't know anything but. This is my situation. It's a broken situation. For some of you, you've come out of either alcoholic situations, drug situations, just busted family situations, anger, emotion, instability, financial instability, all of it, and this is your situation. This is what it's always going to be. Why? Because that's what it's always been, and that's your situation. And because of that, not only is that your situation, it's also caused you to build prejudices for other people's situation. Because their situation is different than yours, maybe in your mind better than yours, and because it's better than yours, at least through your view, guess what? That's not fair. And so the situation, I mean, think about what Mephibosheth, if anybody could say that's not fair, it could be him. It's not, I didn't do it, it's my, it's my grandpa. I didn't throw the spirit, David. I didn't, I didn't bring the armies after him. I was five years old. 
I got, I got no skin in this game. And yet his circumstance, his situation, he lived looking back at this going, I've got to stay hidden. I've got to stay hidden. I've got to stay hidden. I wonder in your life if there's still things you're trying to hide from God based on your situation. You just don't think you're enough. You don't think, you don't think he's going to want you. Why would you go to the king? Why would you go back to the king if all you've ever heard is that he's angry at you? I, I grew up in, in, in a church situation in certain times in my, in my childhood, I grew up, and the only thing that I knew about God is he was mad about everything. Don't go to the movies. You don't do this. You don't listen to that kind of music. You don't, you don't dance. I mean, th- you say it was seriously? Yeah, that was still seriously a thing when I was growing up. Still seeing those things. And you, and you can't ever, man, Christians aren't allowed to. We're supposed to be just not real happy people. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about? Like, maybe this wasn't your upbringing. Maybe you were blessed and you had a little bit of freedom in you. And, that, and if so, that's great. But for a lot of, there's a cross-section of us, and we didn't understand that. It was like, if you don't do everything just right, then there's a chance the lightning bolt is going to shoot out of the sky. I can remember going to the church late at night. When I, I can remember I would break curfew, and before I would sneak in my living room window, I would sneak into the church. I'm not even Catholic, but I would go to repent. I would go confess in the church altars, the little Baptist church on the edge of town. And I would go in there and I would pray, God, I know I'm late. I'm sorry, God. I know I shouldn't disrespect my mom and dad. And I know it's going to be bad. And they're probably going to kill me. And if I don't make it out, I just want to make sure I make it home. (sighs) Crying, because that's what I do. I've never been really taught that there was an option because I just felt like everything that I was doing was looked at because of my situation, and my situation was too much. And then we see Mephibosheth in the same boy. We, l- listen, as we go into this passage, we hear this is how he comes to David. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and he fell on his face. Even in his lineage, they keep reminding us who he is. It's not just Mephibosheth. It's Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, the, that guy. They tried to tear the, the whole kingdom apart. They tried to destroy the entire nation, chasing one person. That's whose grandson you are. They won't even just say his name without reminding you of where he's from. Any of y'all ever got over something in your life, but people won't let you forget where you're from? Oh, you still getting high? I remember asking somebody one time, we were dealing with, just dealing with a person, and we were talking, we were friends, and I just out, of, just out of conversation, I knew the past, so I just simply said, I said, hey, you stand straight? His shoulders slumped, and he said, you know, one day, no one's going to ask me that first. It was a good moment for me. And God, I think probably Mephibosheth lived in that moment where, as they announced him, Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, you know, one day, that's not how they're going to remember me. See, it wasn't just his situation, but it was also his circumstance. He was, dro- he was crippled in this culture, in this biblical cur- culture, to be crippled meant a few things. And you can find this in the Bible if you read it out. You can find that in the Bible, if you were crippled, you were, had a couple places you could hang out. You could hang outside the gates of the temple, and hopefully receive some money as a handout. Or in the Old Testament, we see the lepers and the cripples pushed to the outside of the city walls. And you just stayed out there. And hopefully you could maybe beg from somebody that came in the city. But you weren't even worthy to be in the city. This gentleman lived outside the city in the land of the region of Lodabar. And he was crippled. In fact, if you remember when David asked, is there anyone in Jonathan's family? The way he's defined is, oh yeah, there's Jonathan's kid, the cripple. He didn't do it. He fell. It was a moment that happened that had become his definer throughout his life now. 
I wonder again in your life, church, and in my life, have there been moments, just a snapshot that happened that has now become the definer as you go forward? It was a moment that you didn't see coming. It was a sin that you didn't anticipate. It wasn't done in malicious intent. It just happened. And I'm not saying it was an accident, but I'm just saying it happened. And because of that moment, I know people that have been out of high school for 50 years and they're still living under a reputation they had as a sophomore. Why? Because that's who we are. We're not good at redeeming people back to who they are in Christ it's easier for us to remember the stuff the lamp we can remember the lamp oh Mephibosheth yeah he's the, that's the Jonathan's boy the crippled one yeah because he's got that, that I don't know what one translation says his ankles were crushed so everywhere he walked there's a drag mark What about you? You still have drag marks on your heart, your soul? Moments you didn't get it right, moments you messed it up, moments the world won't let you forget it because this is who you were. You know it's who you were too. It's not something you can forget about or ignore, but you also know it's not who you want to be. It may be who I was, but it's not who I am because I don't want to be that. I don't want that to be my definer anymore. And so we get this story. The Bible says that the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, Mephibosheth, comes in. David says, Mephibosheth! Exclamation point. I imagine the room shook, and I'm sure Mephibosheth did the same thing. As he was on his face, I am your servant. I'm your servant. I got nothing to offer you. I, I, I can't bring any value. I, I, I can't bring any lands. I can't even bring a reputation. You know it. I can't bring my health because I'm, I'm dragging this slake around. I'm probably here for you to kill me anyway, but I am your servant. Face down before a king. I want you to catch what's happening here. The, this one who didn't deserve to be in the room has come to the room and said, I have nothing to offer. And David begins to speak to him. He says, Mephibosheth, I, I'm so glad that you're here. Verse 8, after David speaks to him, Mephibosheth says this. He said, what is... He's confused because David just, David just said, hey, Mephibosheth, I, I'm going to give you your servant back. I'm going to give you Ziba back. And his household, his entire household, he has 15 sons. His entire household is going to, they're going to take care of you. And I'm, I'm going to give you all the lands of your father, Saul. I'm going to give you everything that he owned. It's going to be yours now. And Ziba's going to go with you, and he's going to take care of you. And, and I can almost see as he's face down, as he starts to look up with confusion, and most likely if it was me, there would be tears because I don't deserve this. <laughs> I don't deserve, why would you give this to me? Why would you do this to me? I don't, I'm broken. I got nothing to bring you. I'm just, I'm a dog is what the scripture says. That's what he says next. He said, why would you look upon me a dead dog such as I am? David, this doesn't make sense. And in the Old Testament, we get the cleanest picture of the cross that happens in the New Testament of anywhere else as I come before the cross and I say, God, I have nothing to offer you. I have nothing to bring you except my soul, except my life. And so I'm laying it down. 
And the king says, not only am I going to give you a seat at the table, but I'm going to bless you at the table. Not only am I going to let you in the throne room, I'm going to give you a chair in the throne room. The end of this chapter says, and so from that day on, Mephibosheth sat at the king's table like a son of the king. I wonder in your life if you've been just dragging this past behind you and you've been wondering why God hasn't been there. He's been calling. He's been looking for you. You've been hiding on the outside of the kingdom. You've been staying just outside because the only way to come back is to go, I got nothing, but what I got is yours. And I promise you, the king of redemption, the king of glory, the one who says, hey, I'm going to take all of that stuff, and not only am I going to give you a seat, I'm not only going to give you a place, but I'm going to give you a purpose. That's what God is doing for you today. This redemption, this reconnecting series, that's what the whole thing is about. There are people sitting outside these church walls waiting for a seat at the table. And you know who has it to offer them? You and I. But bitch, you don't know my past. I don't need to know your past. I don't need to know it. Why? Because I know the king of the future. I know the king who set the table and he put your chair there. And that's enough for me. It ought to be enough for you. Remember what I said earlier. God has done everything on his side of the reconnect. It's up to me. Mephibosheth had to walk in the throne room. David said, send for him. He could have kept running further away. No. Send for him. Send for him. There's a difference between send for him and go get him. When you're a king, you get both options. He said, send for him. Is Mephibosheth here? Uh, yeah. King wants to see him. Why? He's going to have to talk to the king. It's going to take him a while. Yeah, I know. We understand. Just tell him the king wants to see him. I want you to bow with me, church, if you would, for a second. Because I want some of you to understand this morning that the king wants to see you. And he's sending for you. He's sending for you. He's calling out for you. He's crying out for you. From the moment the cross was a reality and the tomb was empty, he's been crying out for you, saying, I want to just reconnect with you. I want, I want you to know what redemption is. I want you to know what it is to be bought with a price. I want you to know what it is to be at the king's table. And he's sent for you. And for some of you this morning, Your situation or a past moment the enemy is trying to convince you right now that you're not worth it ah you won't be able to change anyway no you're not going to be able to do that no don't listen to what the preacher's saying that king that that's that jesus stuff isn't for you you know where you came out of none of your family was ever like that no 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 today the story changes Today, the, today your seat changes. You, you don't sit in somebody else's house. You got a seat at the king's table if, if you'll accept it. If you'll accept it. But you, you got to move. You, you got to move. You, you got to step into your part of the reconnecting. You've got to step into your side of, of the equation. God has came all the way from heaven to earth and back again to get you. And today he brought you here on purpose with the intention of reconnecting with you.